thanks for dropping in. For the last month, I've been sculpting mini movie monsters on the iPad. Now that we've reached the final episode, it's time for the biggest baddie of the silver screen to join the party. Count Dracula. So without further ado, let's switch to the time lapse and see how this model came to life. Or undeath. Okay, here we are in Nomad Sculpt. My overall workflow is pretty established at this point. Dracula is built almost entirely out of spheres, which are resized and positioned using the gizmo tool. These spheres are then mushed into shape using the move tool. And finally, the flatten tool comes into play here and there to create distinct surfaces and sharp edges. This monster series hasn't had a happy looking monster since the ghost, so let's bring that back. As I sculpt Dracula's upper lip, I pull it into a broad smile with a very prominent wrinkle near each cheek. The fangs needed clear edges to show up in the print, so those were sharpened with some heavy use of the flatten tool. Dracula's hair is constructed out of a few separate shapes, the widow's peak, his sideburns, and the rest. This made shaping the hair a lot easier than when I was sculpting Frankenstein's head so I'll probably use this method more in the future, especially with complicated hairstyles. Like most of the models from this series, I'm giving Dracula these cat-like pupils. They show up a lot better in print. Moving on to the body, I knew that most of this was going to be covered up with the cape, but I wanted to make sure that Dracula had broad, pointy shoulders that would indicate that he does actually have arms under there. For the legs, I used the tube tool and set the diameter to taper a bit closer to the feet. While shaping the shoes, I added a large cylinder to act as a ground indicator. This is a trick I saw in a Dave Reed sculpting tutorial, and it's really helpful. Eventually I will trim the bottom of this model to give it an actual flat surface, but that's much better to put off until the very end. For the vest, I cloned the torso and scaled it up slightly then use the trim tool to cut the right side of the vest. I then repeated the process for the left side. I then used the move tool to pull parts of the fabric out so it wouldn't be quite as form-fitting. Finally, a couple buttons gives this vest a little class. I reused the trick from the Frankenstein model and added cuffs to Dracula's pants using the pipe tool, but this time around I angled the bottom of the cuffs so they'd be even easier to print. Now it's time for the billowing cape. Once the overall form was sculpted, I created a rectangle to cut out the front edge. Then I used a cone to cut out a round interior wall to give the cape some deeper interior shadows. Next, we have the impractically huge collar. This was a great job for the pipe tool because I could get smooth sweeping shapes with a lot of control. I also wanted to be able to control the collar's thickness if it's too thin, it would be a nightmare to print. After a lot of tweaking, I merged both halves of the collar together and blended the seam. This created an accidental point at the back of the head that I decided to keep. It's the sort of dramatic decorative cut a vampire would want to the cape. The vest was looking a little boring, so I zoomed way in and gave the edges a little chamfer that should help those edges pop. Finally, I used the tube tool again to give Dracula some impressive eyebrows. And here's the final print. I'll admit it, Dracula probably was not the most challenging design of the series, especially when you compare him to last week's werewolf. So I decided to focus instead on printability. At 100% scale, this model can be printed without supports. There can be a few stray filament wisps buried under the cape, but those are really hidden. As you saw earlier, I also printed a 200% scale copy. In fact, I printed 200% scale copies of the entire series. If you decide to print a larger Dracula, or larger versions of any of these models, keep an eye on the overhangs that just barely work on the default scale. These overhangs become less and less sustainable and may require supports. In the case of this larger Dracula, I added supports under his nose and his chin. 
Well, that's the end of our weekly Sculpt Timber series, but it's not the end of my plans to keep sculpting. I hope to make more of these character-driven designs whenever inspiration strikes. While I doubt I'll make actual detailed videos on those designs, you'll see them show up as bonus models above and beyond my regular work. In two weeks, I'll be back with my usual schedule in some sort of mechanically adjacent cat design. So until then, happy printing and thanks for stopping by. Thanks for sticking around. I know this month was all about sculpting, but I had to sneak in a little bit of cat work. This 150% scale of the Happy Ghosts is actually a print-in-place puzzle. It uses the same mechanism as my other print-in-place puzzle designs. So if you've printed one of those in the past, you can just print the ghost's outer shell and reuse the core that you already have. This puzzle comes in both easy and difficult variations, so you can decide just how scary solving this ghost will be. Alright, see you next time.